Patricia has written a wonderful book. Tonight she's going to talk about this towering figure, Meriwether Lewis, selected by Thomas Jefferson to lead the expedition to explore the Louisiana Purchase. This will be a very interesting evening indeed. Patricia Tyson Stroud is an independent scholar and lives in Wayne. A graduate of Smith College, she is the author of many books, two of which have won the Literary Award from the Athenaeum in Philadelphia. Throughout her career, Ms. Tyson Stroud contributed Stroud, contributed to different publications and has won awards for her many books. Tonight, the author will talk about Bitterroot, The Life and Death of Meriwether Lewis. Also, I'd like to tell you that Patricia is the author of Thomas Say, New World Naturalist, The Emperor of Nature, Charles Lucien Bonaparte and His World, The Man Who Had Been King, The American Exile of Napoleon's Brother Joseph, and with Robert McCracken Peck, A Glorious Enterprise, The Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia and the Making of American Science. Please welcome to Radnor Memorial Library, Patricia Tyson Stroud. My inspiration for Bitterroot, The Life and Death of Mary Weather Lewis, came from the bicentennial exhibition of the Lewis and Clark uh, uh, expedition in 206 at the Academy of Natural Sciences. The interesting character of the expedition leader came through strongly to me in that wonderful exhibit. Because of Lewis's strong interest and knowledge in botany, the Academy was a perfect place for it, as the institution holds hundreds of Lewis's collection of plant specimens in the botany department, most of them in his original herbarium sheets. Meriwether Lewis in 1806 brought back from the Rocky Mountains a specimen of the beautiful bitterroot flower. This is not moving. Okay, got it. Um, the bitterroot flower. Subsequently, the plant was found to belong to a new genus and was named in his honor. It serves as a metaphor for this book, explain, explaining this theme, that five years after Lewis's death, his mentor, Thomas Jefferson, in his short memoir of Lewis, prefacing the account of the expedition, assumed from unsubstantiated reports that Lewis's death was by suicide. Jefferson did not refute the wholly undocumented claims that Lewis died as the result of depression and alcoholism. And because of Jefferson's prestige, these charges have entered the canon of Lewis's biography, thus the root of bitterness. But from Lewis's voluminous journal notes and correspondence with friends and relations, as well as the lack of any statements referring to these claims by either friends or enemies, I attempt to establish that Lewis was not the man he has been portrayed for so many years to be. Meriwether Lewis was born in 1774 to a long established Virginia family, originally from Wales, on a plantation called Locust Hill, just outside Charlottesville, Virginia. His father, an officer in the Revolution, died of pneumonia when Lewis was five, leaving his wife and three children. Lucy Meriwether Lewis, an attractive and capable woman, managed the 2,000-acre plantation farmed by slaves until she remarried a year later, a man related to Jefferson. Jefferson had known the Lewis and Meriwether families all his life. As the eldest son, Lewis inherited Locust Hill at his majority, but the life of a planter was not his calling. With his yearning for adventure, he chose the life of a soldier. I do not know how to account for this quixotic disposition of mind, he wrote to his mother from an encampment, than that of having inherited it in the right of the Merriweather family, and it therefore immediately calls on your charity to forgive those errors into which it may any time lead me. Her genes, he says, are responsible for his adventuresome spirit. Other than genes, the knowledge she imported to him as a youth concerning the identification of healing herbs and numerous other wild plants would be useful to him in his future career. In 
1801, when Jefferson became the third president of the United States, he summoned Lewis to be his secretary. The president may have had in mind that Lewis, by then a captain and a seasoned military officer, could perhaps lead the expedition to the Pacific Ocean that he had planned for years without success, even while minister to France in the 1790s. This portrait bust was done by Jean-Antoine Jean Houdon at the time. Thus in 1803, Jefferson proposed this idea to Congress, envisioning a water course across the country over a mountain range no higher than the Alleghenies. <laughs> Congress approved and Jefferson sent Lewis to Philadelphia to accumulate supplies and equipment and be coached in various disciplines by members of the American Philosophical Society, located just behind Independence Hall is this building, which I'm sure you all know, which still exists and is very much used by the American Philosophical Society. <clears throat> One of the men Jefferson asked to coach his protege was Dr. Benjamin Rush for advice on medications to deal with various illnesses that they would come across. Another was Caspar Wistar for the study of anatomy and also Robert Patterson to strengthen Lewis's knowledge of longitude and latitude. Jefferson wrote to these members of the society, who were his friends, explaining that it was impossible to find a character who to a complete science in botany, natural history, mineralogy, and astronomy, joined with the firmness of constitution and character, prudence, habits adapted to the woods, and a familiarity with the Indian manners and character requisite for this undertaking. All the latter qualifications Captain Lewis has, though not a regular botanist, nevertheless he has a remarkable store of accurate observation of animals, plants, and minerals, he said. Lewis spent a week in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at the home of Andrew Ellicott, a preeminent surveyor who tutored him in methods of accurate land measurements. This house still exists as a museum. It's, it's really charming. While in Philadelphia, Lewis spent time with his good friend, Malon Dickerson, whom he had known in the militia when fighting the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. They dined with acquaintances such as Jefferson's friends, George and Deborah Logan at Stenton Mansion in Germantown also exists, as you know, as a museum, and Governor Thomas McCain in Philadelphia, in addition to visiting Charles Wilson Peale's museum. Lewis and Dickerson closely resembled each other in their elegant hairstyles and clothing, both very much in the fashion of the day. In early June, Captain Lewis left Philadelphia for Pittsburgh just after the wagon and five horse team he had hired to haul his 3,500 pounds of equipment with the expedition departed. He planned to meet it there but in Pittsburgh. But before leaving, he wrote the most important letter of his planned expedition, requesting his friend William Clark, under whom he once had served in the army, to join him as co-captain in his great venture. Clark answered, my friend, I do assure you that no man lives with whom I would prefer to take such a trip as yourself. I join you with hand and heart. As Clark had resigned earlier from the army for personal reasons, Lewis requested that the government enlist Clark as a captain, the same as his own rank. But later when he was in St. Louis before embarking, he received a letter stating that the administration had appointed Clark a lieutenant. Angry and disappointed, Lewis insisted that Clark be regarded as a captain by the assembled soldiers. The men never knew that Clark's actual, actual rank was different from Lewis's. Now we go back to Pittsburgh. Once Lewis's considerable supplies were loaded on a barge, he, along with several recruits he had chosen, began his journey down the Ohio River to meet Clark in Louisville, Kentucky. 
there to begin one of the most perfect collaborations in American history. Together they chose others to accompany them, soldiers they already knew or who were recommended as reliable. They both agreed that no gentleman would do for the journey. For they foresaw they needed only strong, unmarried young men accustomed to the hardships of wilderness life. The Louisiana Purchase, recently transferred from Spain to France, then shortly sold by Napoleon to the United States, was that momentous deal that doubled the size of the country, taking it from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. It had become official on July 4th, 1803, but the actual transfer did not take place until the following March in St. Louis. On March 9th, 1804, the Spanish flag came down and the French tricolor went up, only to be replaced the next day by the Stars and Stripes. Thus, in two days, hundreds of millions of acres changed hands between three countries an unprecedented event in world history. Lewis signed the transfer papers along with the Spanish and French representatives. Only the Indians who had lived there for centuries were unrepresented. On Monday morning, May 21st, 1824, the expedition set, up, set off up the Missouri River. <coughs> They left from St. Charles, just above the mouth of the Missouri, where it empties into the Mississippi, destined to cross a huge portion of the North American continent, where no expedition of white men had gone before. Down here is St. Charles, where they left from. This is the Mississippi River. And this is the Missouri, this wiggly, wiggly river is the Missouri. This is William Clark, a composite of William Clark's map. This is all the Missouri. Unknown to Lewis and Clark, oh, before that I said, the men, um, the difficulties of ascending the um, Missouri against the current, it's a wide river, the difficulties were legion. The men had to pull the keel boat up the wide river if the current was too strong, they attached a cable to the mast and dragged the boat along from the shore. Unknown to Lewis and Clark, there was a Spanish plan afoot to stop them. The Spanish, jealously guarding their gold and silver mines in Mexico and the land above it, were warned by their spy, designated number 13, that Lewis's party was headed in that direction and must be stopped. Astonishingly, number 13 was none other than General James Wilkinson, of, head of the U.S. Army, and in the secret pay of the Spanish for years. Many had suspected this treachery by such a scoundrel, but it was not until a hundred years later that proof was found in the archives of Madrid. But even though the Spanish authorities sent out an armed patrol of 200 men to stop the expedition, they never found it. Pardon me one minute. Four months later, after leaving, as the expedition proceeded up the Missouri, an unfortunate encounter with a hostile Teton Sioux could have turned out badly but the Corps managed to come away without a serious incident. To these Indians, as well as others, Lewis and Clark attempted friendship by giving their chief a Jefferson Peace Medal. Jefferson's portrait on one side with shaking hands and friendship on the other. At times, this gift caused offense and was quite unsuccessful when the captains unwittingly chose the wrong chief to give it to. Entirely different from the Sioux were the peaceful Mandans in present-day North Dakota, with whom Lewis planned to spend the winter. In the time spending acquainted, acquainted with the customs and habits of the tribe and its chiefs, the explorers often joined the Mandans on buffalo hunts, which promoted goodwill on both sides. The Indians on horseback 
and the explorers on foot. The buffalo, actually an American bison, a different species from a buffalo, was a major source of meat, housing, clothing, and tools for the Indians. The Mandans so valued their horses for pursuit of the buffalo that they kept them inside their tents against theft from, from the Sioux. As you can see, the Indian, the, the um, horses in the tent. It was at Fort Mandan that Lewis and Clark hired Toussaint Charbonneau, part French and part Indian, as an interpreter. His teenage wife, Sacagawea, who gave birth that winter to their child, Jean Baptiste, was an asset on the journey. Sacagawea spoke Shoshone, the language of her Indian tribe in the Rockies, who were known to have horses, essential for the expedition to scale the mountains. As it turned out, she also served as a sign of peaceful intentions, because Indian warriors never took women and children along on war parties. She did not lead the expedition, as has been said, but she did recognize certain topographical features as the Corps drew near her ancestral home. When the two large pirogues and six small canoes left Fort Mandan in early April, Lewis wrote in his journal, this little fleet, although not quite as respectable as those of Columbus or Captain Cook, were still viewed by us with as much pleasure as those deservedly famed adventurers ever beheld, beheld theirs, and I dare say with quite as much as anxiety for their safety and preservation. We were now about to penetrate a country at the, of at least 2,000 miles in width on which the foot of civilized man had never traveled. Thinking of the time long before when he had once asked Jefferson to appoint him leader of just such a journey, but he'd been too young and inexperienced, <clears throat> he wrote in his journal, this expedition has formed a darling project of mine for the last 10 years. I could but esteem this moment of my departure <clears throat> as among the most happy of my life. These are hardly the words of a troubled man as Ken Burns claims in the beginning of his expedition film. On reaching the Missouri River breaks, as these natural formations are called, Lewis's innate romanticism enriched the description he wrote of these stunning white sandstone cliffs. Probably familiar with pictures of ancient Rome and Egyptian sites and books from Jefferson's library, he recorded, we see the remains of ruins of elegant buildings, some column, columns standing and almost entire with pedestals and capitals, others retaining their pedestals but be deprived by time or accident of their capitals, some lying prostrate and broken, others in the form of vast pyramids of conic structure bearing a series of other pyramids on their tops. As we passed on, it seemed as if those scenes of visionary enchantment would never end." <clears throat> Unquote. When the Corps finally reached the Shoshone Indians in the Rockies, fortuitously, Sacagawea recommended, recognized their chief, Kamehawake, as her brother, which smoothed the way to obtain horses for the ascent of the mountains. Long after the expedition returned, Charles Wilson Peale would make a wa wax model of Lewis with the tippet or stole of ermine tails, excuse me, that too fast, around his neck given to him by Camille Waite as an elegant gesture of friendship. Crossing the Rockies at the Bitterroot Range in late autumn was more precarious than the explorers could have imagined. In the snow and ice, several horses lost their footing and rolled down the mountain and were badly injured. The men boiled snow for drinking water, and to boil a colt they had to sacrifice for food, which was running out. Some four months later, after numerous difficulties and adventures overcoming the endless Rockies, the expedition at last reached the large, fast-moving Columbia River, where, near the mouth, they built Fort Clatsop, named after a nearby tribe. Here they spent the winter of 1806. Many of the customs of the Northwest Coast Indians, the explorers found to be different from other tribes they had encountered, especially those of the Flathead Indians, 
an infant would be placed in a spit right up at the top is this drawing of Clark's placed in a special cradle board with an angle board tied on and compressing its forehead. As the child grew, its head became decidedly pointed, a shape considered a mark of beauty and superior status. The Indian slaves, that is, those Indians captured from other tribes, were forbidden from adopting this considered aristocratic pra practice. This picture is from Clark's journal. Many Indian arts were more appreciated by the explorers, such as those of this West Coast Salish, Salish Indian village with their elegant shaped and decorated canoes. <clears throat> Lewis noted that there were definite signs of foreign trading ships, including Americans who had visited these shores of the Pacific Ocean. The Indians form us, inform us, Lewis wrote with a certain amount of amusement, they speak the same language as ourselves and give us proofs of their veracity by repeating many words of English, such as powder, shot, knife, file, damned rascal, and son of a bitch. <laughs> Learning from the Indians of a beached whale, Clark was able to trade for 300 pounds of blubber and a few gallons of oil. Lewis noted in his journal that Quote, small as this store is, we prize it highly and thank Providence for directing the whale to us and think him much more kind to us than he was to Jonah, having sent this monster to be swallowed by us instead of swallowing of us as Jonah's whale did. Lewis's journal is filled with references to unusual plants, birds, and animals such as this, well, excuse me, wolverine who had once attempted to attack him. Also interesting were fish, like a Yushalan, so-called candlefish, that were so fatty the Indians dried them and ran wicks through them for use as candles. This is a drawing in Lewis's journal. His collections of specimens had been accumulating all along the way. Plants such as Indian tobacco he pressed between sheets of blotting paper then birds and animal skins, such as those of the pronged horn uh, antelope, were also carefully packed to bring back for science. In late March, the Corps set out on the return journey up the Columbia, across the Snake and Clearwater Rivers. This is the Columbia here. This is the the Columbia going across. Then they went onto the Snake and the Clearwater River, which then by the Indians was called the Kuskusi, and and then had to go across these huge mountain range, the Bitter the Bitterroot Range. Perhaps some encounters with their Indian neighbors had left a favorable impression, as Jefferson's Peace Medal was dug up decades later in an Indian burial site near the Columbia River. There is no accounting for the da damage of it. On the return journey, Lewis and Clark split the party to explore in different directions. Clark experienced no mishaps, but Lewis, with a small contingent, encountered a band of the formidable Blackfeet Indians from whom they barely escaped. Then later, Partway down the Missouri, before joining Clark's contingent, Lewis was on shore hunting with his half-blind French interpreter, Cousat, when the latter mistook him for a deer and shot him in the thigh. Lewis, thinking they were under attack, called to Cousat and, armed with his rifle, struggled back to the boat. Fortunately, the bullet did not break his hip, but it was excruciatingly painful and took time to heal. I was determined as a retreat was impracticable to sell my life as dearly as possible, he wrote later of this assumed hostility. The expedition arrived back to St. Louis much rejoicing on 23 September 1806 after covering 8,000 miles in two years and five months. Lewis wrote Jefferson at once. Because there was so much to attend to in the town at St. Louis, such as getting new clothes made and selling off many of the army supplies that were no longer needed, 
he had time to get Jefferson's reply. Quote, I receive, my dear sir, with unspeakable joy, your letter of September 23, announcing the return of yourself, Captain Clark, and your party in good health to St. Louis. The unknown scenes in which you were engaged and the length of time without hearing from you had begun to be felt awfully. Once Lewis arrived back in the East, great festivities awaited him in Washington, where he was welcomed as a national hero. He had brought back from the Mandan villages one of their chiefs. Oops, keep hitting the wrong thing. Uh, Shehaki Shote, or Big White, with his wife and child, who were welcomed and fated with much enthusiasm. Clark had stayed in Virginia to marry his fiancée, Julia Hancock. After spending the winter in Washington with the president, Lewis went to Philadelphia, where he visited Charles Wilson Peel and his famous museum, located on the second floor of Independence Hall. Here he presented Peel with specimens of birds and animals from his expedition. Many of these would be displayed in cabinets along, along the wall. All, all these cabinets had quite a few of Lewis's stuffed animals and things in them. Um, Many also were displayed the portraits that Peel painted of Lewis and Clark here with the portraits of famous people all along here. So he added them to his collection. In particular, of the animals Lewis had collected were two birds that were later, later named after him, Lewis's woodpecker on the right and Clark's crow. Lewis's botanic, botanical specimens he turned over to Frederick Persch, a brilliant young German botanist, to be described scientifically. They included such plants as the syringa or mock orange, later named after him by Perch, Philadelphia Lewisii, and the bitterroot, which is Rediviva, Lewisia Rediviva. Rediviva refers to its ability to regenerate from dry and seemingly dead roots, which a horticulturalist in Philadelphia was able to do from the roots that, that Lewis brought back. These specimens and hundreds like them are today in the botany department at the Academy of Natural Sciences. This is the portrait of Lewis that Peel painted at the time. The cue and fashionable hairstyle he once sported are long gone replaced by the straight shortcut of an army officer. Though Lewis was eager to begin researching and writing his account of the journey, Jefferson had other plans for him. As a reward, for, a reward for leading the expedition, he appointed him governor of the Louisiana Territory. <coughs> Carolyn Gilmer of the Smithsonian has written, and I quote, the appointment of Lewis to a political post was a colossal blunder. He was an introvert accustomed to commanding others rather than beguiling them. And he was unsuited to the deal-making of political life in a town where an entrenched mercantile oligarchy clashed with turbulent new populist factions." Unquote. There would be no time to write the account of the expedition from the journals he and Clark had kept, a project Lewis had eagerly and carefully planned and arranged for in Philadelphia after his return, enlisting artists and scientists and publishing an exhausting prospectus to encompass three volumes. However, before heading west for his new post, Jefferson sent Lewis to Richmond to his, be his eyes and ears at the trial of Aaron Burr for treason. Burr was accused of planning to separate the Southwest from the rest of the country and invading Mexico with its fabulously rich silver mines in a filibustering expedition, even though the United States was not at war with Spain, in which case such a plan would have been legal. His chief accuser was the infamous General Wilkinson. He had once been a provisional governor of Louisiana Territory at the same time that he was also head of the army. There were rich lead mines south of St. Louis about which there had been speculation 
concerning Wilkinson's questionable involvement, as well as his suspected attachment to Burr and his so-called traitorous scheme. Burr was acquitted, though his reputation was ruined, and Wilkinson was never charged. Lewis, at last arriving in St. Louis for his new appointment, accompanied only by his servant Pernier, a free man of color, found that his secretary, Frederick Bates, was hostile to him and attempted to counteract some of his orders. Bates had been acting governor for nearly a year and no doubt resented Lewis's presence replacing him. But he was also somewhat relieved because Lewis's challenging assignment was to govern a vast, recently acquired land filled with well-armed, often hostile Indian tribes, rough traders, coarse boatmen, unruly and mostly unlawful land and mineral so-called developers. There was a relatively small community of longtime Creoles who attempted to hold on to their cultured way of life and resented the push of new American settlers. In unruly St. Louis, it was obviously necessary to publish the laws of the territory. Because Bates's request of the government had been rejected, Lewis drew on his own salary in advance to move a printer and his press to St. Louis. There were further expenses to buy ink and paper as well as translate a number of copies into French. Trusting the government to reimburse him would prove a grave mistake. In addition to numerous other concerns, there was the problem of getting the Mandan chief Shaheki and his family back to the Mandan tribe. A previous attempt had failed due to the hostile Sioux who had killed several men on that expedition. Lewis again advanced his own money to partially supply the second try, organized to accomplish this endeavor. Because the mail often took months for him to receive a reply from Washington, he frequently had to proceed without confirmation of his decisions. When he sent vouchers to the government for returning Shaki, as well as other bills, necessary for running the territorial government, the Secretary of War refused to honor them. Lewis was understandably insulted and angry that his integrity and judgment had been questioned. The lack of reimbursement threw him into debt, so he resolved to go east to protest the Secretary's decision and to recover his finances. After he left St. Louis on 4 September 1809, accompanied only by his servant, Pernier. William Clark wrote to his brother, I do not believe there was ever an honester man in Louisiana nor one who had purer motives than Governor Lewis. Lewis had planned to go by way of New Orleans and then by boat to the East Coast. But having heard on his journey down the Mississippi that malaria was raging in New Orleans, he decided to stop at Fort Pickering the site of present-day Memphis, and proceed overland. By the time he reached the fort, he himself had an attack of malaria, which he had experienced many times before, so he was prepared with medicine, the Peruvian bark or quinine. The day after landing, he was well enough to write to then-President Madison, advising him of his change of plans. I bring with me duplicates of my vouchers for public expenditures, etc., he said, which, when fully explained, I flatter myself that they will receive both sanction and approbation. Three months later, reporting to Jefferson, Captain Gilbert Russell, the fort's commander, told the ex-president that six days after Lewis arrived, he had been, quote, perfectly restored in every respect and able to travel. Shortly after Lewis had reached Fort Pickering, a certain James Neely, recently appointed agent for the Chickasaw Nation to the south and unknown to him, came to the fort and insisted on accompanying the governor as far as Nashville. On 29 September 1809, Lewis rode off into the Tennessee wilderness with the ambiguous Neely, Pernier, and Neely's servant. The truth of what happened in the forests of Tennessee now becomes a tangled web, and the accounts of it bizarre in every way. The actual events that occurred after Neely stayed behind to find several lost horses, 
and Lewis arrived alone at a crude cabin called Grinder's Stand to spend the night, are shrouded in mystery from which the truth may never be known. That Lewis died there of gunshot wounds in the early morning of 11 October 1809 is the only certainty. More than a week after Lewis's death at Grinder's Stand, Neely wrote to Jefferson from Nashville, quote, it is with extreme pain that I have to inform you of the death of His Excellency Meriwether Lewis, Governor of Upper Louisiana, who died on the 11th, and I'm sorry to say, by suicide. Neely claimed in his letter that on their route, Lewis appeared at times deranged in mind. He said that after they crossed the Tennessee River and camped for the night, two horses broke away and he had stayed behind to find them, suggesting that Lewis await him at the first inn he came to. This was a strange arrangement for someone supposed to have been out of his mind. At the crude inn, there had been only the owner's wife, Mrs. Grinder, who occupied an adjoining cabin. The servants who came up later stayed further off in a stable loft. In the morning when Neely finally arrived, he found Lewis's body. Mrs. Grinder told him that in the middle of the night she had heard two gunshot, gunshots, but she did not leave her cabin. Two days after Neely's letter to Jefferson, the account of Lewis's death with added embellishments that the government of Louisiana Territory had cut his wrist, unmentioned in Neely's letter to Jefferson, came out in a Nashville paper. As the days went by, the story picked up increasingly lurid details, manufactured out of thin air, for there were no witnesses. One account claimed that Lewis was, quote, delirious and in a fit. At the end of January, nearly four months after Lewis's death, Jefferson received a letter from Gilbert Russell at Fort Pickering containing letters unmentioned in his letter to the ex-president one month earlier. Quote, the fact is, which you may yet be ignorant of, is that his untimely death may be attributed solely to the free use he made of liquor. This is the first mention ever of alcoholism in regard to Lewis. Russell concluded that from the statement of Mrs. Grinder, I cannot help believe that Pernier was rather aiding and abetting in the murder than otherwise. But wait, who had said anything about murder? Was this an unintended slip? And Mrs. Grinder apparently never mentioned Pernier. One wonders what had occurred in the interim of Russell's two letters, weeks apart, to make him change his statements to Jefferson so radically. Had there been a plot? Was he being threatened? Was Mrs. Grinder? There are possibilities. The only one who visited the site of Lewis's death was his friend, the ornithologist Andrew, and Alexander Wilson that following spring who found Mrs. Grinder's account of the events problematic. Jefferson, however, accepted without investigation Neely's report of suicide. The word of someone unknown to him, as well as three months later, corroborating the Fort Commander's second letter about alcoholism. That April of 1810, Jefferson answered this Gilbert Russell with a strange letter, quote, we have all to lament that a fame so dearly earned was clouded finally by such an act of desperation. He was much afflicted and habitually so with hypochondria, the word at the time for depression. Jefferson continued, this was probably increased in the habit, referring to alcohol, into which he had fallen and the painful reflections that would necessarily produce in a mind like his. His loss to the world is a very great one. Jefferson ends his letter to Russell with assurances of my esteem and respect. Esteem and respect? How could it not have occurred to such a brilliant man as Jefferson, had not, who had known Lewis's character for so long and so well, that there was something suspect in Russell's second letter 
And why would he have answered as he did, corroborating what Russell had said? Four years later, in Jefferson's preface to the truncated edition of the Lewis and Clark journals, prepared and ed edited by Nicholas Biddle, he would state that he had seen signs of depression while Lewis served as his secretary, and that in St. Louis this had returned on him with redoubled vigor. It's a quote. Who would have told him that? There is no evidence of such a report in Jefferson's letters or in anyone else's letters. Jefferson would thus hand over to succeeding generations until our own time a negative, unsubstantiated view of Meriwether Lewis as a depressed person with a serious drinking habit who killed himself. In the first place, why would Jefferson have selected an unstable person to lead the expedition that he had dreamed of for years and convinced Congress to accept? What if Lewis, the leader, should collapse on the journey? There is no evidence whatsoever in Lewis or Clark's journals of depression in those two and a half years. Captain Lewis was in fact a brilliant soldier who led his party across a large part of the continent exploring an untamed wilderness. As for alcoholism, Frederick Bates, Lewis's secretary in St. Louis, who jealously disliked him, never once mentioned it. And he certainly would have in his numerous candid letters that he wrote to his brother. Oops. Nor did he mention depression. And never did Clark, who might have confided such a worry about his best friend to his own brother in his voluminous correspondence. However, in present day books and films, because of Jefferson's great stature, his words on Lewis's death have been accepted without question. Stephen Ambrose, in Undaunted Courage, states that Lewis was, quote, doing a lot of heavy drinking and that he was depressed because he was unlucky in love, drank too much, and made a spectacle of himself, unquote. Ambrose provides no references for these statements. The author of the companion volume to the Nat National Bicentennial Exhibition of the Historic Journal repeat, repeats the same unverified stories by writing that Lewis, quote, called to account for his expenses, was already deeply depressed, alcohol, alcoholic, and addicted to laudanum, opium. Ken Burns, in his documentary of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, also accepts Jefferson's words. The narrator says that one of the leaders was troubled, that he was dark and gloomy. Lewis's voice in the film is weak and sad while Clark's is strong and forceful. Burns reiterates that Lewis committed suicide. There are many other examples which I point out in this book. However, Lewis's family never accepted the idea of suicide. They thought he was murdered. A member of Lewis's mother's family wrote that his letters written to his mother before starting on his trip home were full of love and affection and so hopeful of a good time with his old friends that she never entertained for a moment, underscored, that he had committed suicide." Unquote. A Lewis contemporary, a U.S. Indian agent on the Arkansas River, while in Washington, learned of his friend's death and wrote to Bates at the end of October 189, this moment the Secretary of War has mentioned to me his having by this day's mail received an account of the extraordinary death of Governor Lewis, for which no one here undertakes to account for. And certainly the short acquaintance I had with him in St. Louis in June wholly precludes my having any reason to offer for his committing an act so very extraordinary and unexpected." Unquote. Bitterroot sets out to show Lewis as we see him in his journals and letters to friends and family and as his contemporaries saw him, and to do away with the layers of misinformation about depression, alcoholism, and suicide that have so tarnished his name. With the many unexplained events and statements connected with Lewis's death, one cannot rule out a conspiracy to assassinate him. There are those who had been afraid of plots by General Wilkins to, ar to arrange such attempts on their own lives. <laughs> 
that's <coughs> mentioned in my book. Theories exist that Lewis knew about Wilkinson's illegal dealings in the lead mines, which the general thought Lewis might disclose in Washington or other nefarious plots of, of which Wilkinson was guilty. Jefferson never had Lewis's death investigated. Could he have suspected Wilkinson as the perpetrator, the man he had backed for years in spite of warnings from many sources that the general was a traitor? It would have tarnished his legacy if the man he had trusted in spite of many warnings had arranged something so devastating. Jefferson wrote of himself, quote, I do not love difficulties. I am fond of quiet, but irritable by slander and apt to be forced to abandon my post, unquote. Did he abandon his post when morality or loyalty called on him to have Lewis's death investigated? The historian David McCullough has said that, quote, Jefferson could be evasive, even at times duplicitous. Jefferson may also have been deeply disappointed that Lewis failed to write the expedition's account, which led him down in the eyes of the savants of, of the U.S. and France, to whom he had promised such an important work. In the end, one can only conclude that Jefferson abandoned his protege after promoting him to such a stunning place in the annals of his country. To me, Lewis's story is a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. The mystery of his death will probably never be solved, but I hope to have challenged the distorted and damaging versions of Lewis's life and character that have lingered for 200 years and to have restored him to the honorable place he deserves in American history. Bitterroot, Lewisia Rediviva. Lewis reclaimed as the man he truly was. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have time for comments and questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, any? Here we have Bitterroot. It's for sale tonight if you'd like to purchase a copy. And now we have uh, comments, questions for Patricia. Any questions? Yes. Oh, not asking you a question. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yes. I was quite amazed by the fact that there are um, French Canadians living in so many Indian villages uh, on their trip up the Missouri. It just seemed like there was French Canadians that lived there for 20 years. Uh, well, up the Missouri, about as far as the Mandan villages, but sure. beyond that, then they, they were. They saw quite a few people. Yeah. Well, they did. They did. Traders. Yes, they did. They, they were tra traitors. Right. Fascinating. Indians. Yeah. How wonderful Foods. the Indian life must have been. Yeah. Interesting. Good. Anything else? Anybody wants to know? Oh, yes? What was your interest in this? Why, why did you pursue this? Um, at the time, I, I was looking for another biography that I would like to write, and at that exhibit at the Academy of Natural Sciences, I thought this was such a fascinating character. And I was just questioning the idea of, of the suicide. Why would such a hero have done that? Why was that seemed to be attached to him? And I wanted to um, research it, and it seemed to me through all the letters and uh, to friends and in his journal, which is voluminous for two years, um, there's not a mention of depression. And, and as I said, his secretary in St. Louis, Frederick Bates, just hated him and was always trying to find things wrong with him and, and undercut him. And he never mentioned alcohol never once, or depression. So where does all that come from? Neely, this strange person that nobody really knows anything about. And that Captain Russell saying that, you know, saying he was perfectly recovered and fine from the malaria, and then writing a month later uh, to Jefferson at the end of January, actually, with three months later, um, that he had, 
been deranged in mind when he came to, to the fort and that he was, he had to keep, it's, it's, there's much more in the book of course, that he had to keep alcohol away from him and um, even that Lewis promised he wouldn't drink anymore, which just doesn't sound like him at all. I mean, it was all kind of phony. So it does sound like there was a plot. I didn't hear you mention any comments by Clark about the situation of his demise. Maybe there were, and maybe I missed it, but I didn't. No, no, I didn't say. Clark, I think, was governor of uh, Missouri by that later uh, later not then, then uh, uh, he questioned it but he never investigated it he just took the word they took the, the, the word for it that he had committed so he never even went there and um, the body is still there under the monument that they put um, uh, near um, it's a, it's about 50 miles south of Nashville there's a Lewis and Clark, I mean, a Meriwether Lewis monument. And uh, it's very odd that Clark didn't, but he was, he had just gotten married and he was very involved with his job. And, um, and he raised and he, his son. Right? Yes, he did. He did take, yeah, educated him. And um, he conferred with uh, Nicholas Biddle over the, the journals. He definitely wanted to publish the journals. Um, but he, Clark didn't write very well, so it, it's better on it was maps. it was better on maps. He made that fabulous map. Yes, quite a cartographer. Uh, who finally did uh, write the, the uh, journal for the for the uh, expedition? Well, it, it was it, it was edited, you might say, well, by by Biddle because. Lewis wrote his journals and Clark wrote his, so he put them together. But he didn't, but he didn't do any of the natural, so he didn't include any of the natural science that Lewis had in, in his journal, a tremendous amount. He, was, he didn't have those notes with him when he was traveling through Tennessee. They were still back in St. Louis. No, he did have them. He, ha he, he did have them. With it. Yep, he had the, all the journals with him because he was going to Philadelphia to, to uh, write them up and publish them. So um, they were they were taken by Neely to given to Jefferson, who sent them on to Washington, and then um, Jefferson collaborated too with Biddle, um, but it was mostly Biddle's working with the journals to produce an account. But it wasn't for a hundred years later that that the account was really in great detail. Um, published, and um, and then in 90, 1996, this uh, Gary Moulton at the University of Nebraska published there about ten volumes of the expedition and fabulously annotated, and um, a, and a transcription of the whole thing. Goodness, it took that long. Yes, yes, Amazing. that long. And what happened to Wilkinson? He ended up in Mexico, and um, he, he was court-martialed about three or four times, but never convicted. He was never prosecuted. And, and no, he never was. And he died kind of ignominy, in, in Me actually, in Mexico. Jefferson didn't, didn't go after him. No, he didn't go after him. <coughs> no. All very strange. All very strange. Yes. I think so. Yes? How did they escape? Indians because there were such savage tribes back there and I read the book Astoria about John Astor as he was trying to get across yes. all of that and they were scalped how did Lewis and Clark come through this alive because well they were proceeding yes John Astor. they they um they were absolutely able to to make friends with the Indians they had a um a man with them who um, spoke incredible sign language. And there were so many, I mean, there are hundreds, there were hundreds of tribes. But they did understand the sign language. And um, that was very helpful. And um, they had presents. 
a lot of Indian presence. It's kind of amazing that they, they weren't captured and scalped. Because some of but the they, pastor's people that went out yeah. ended up committing suicide after trying to get across yeah. to the to well, California. Well, it's amazing that the Lewis and Clark expedition, they, uh, um, only one man died early on, and they think of appendicitis of the, of the symptoms. And um, they were able to make friends with the Indians. And um, they, tra they told them that they were going to set up trading camps so that they would trade. They would bring them guns and all the different things that they needed. And the Indians believed it. And, and they were representatives of the big chief in Washington. Yeah, exactly. So it is amazing. It is. But, but they did escape. Since yeah. they were the first people that went west of, of white people, how did, how did they know, like the Mandams were, were gentle people? And, and, uh, well, other, others had been to the Mandams. So the French, French had come down okay, and so traded had, with them. There was some literature that they could look that at. Was, that was, uh, yeah, they knew that they were uh, gentle people. The Sioux were the ones you had to watch out for. Right. And the black feet. But anyway. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.